If you're about to pick up Scholar for the first time and find it a bit confusing, then this video is for you. This guide starts by teaching you how to play Scholar at level 30 and then explains how to use all of the actions you learned from level 30 to 50 in order. We finish with a combat rotation alongside healing tips and advice for level 50 that encompasses all of the things you learned throughout this guide. Now then, let's begin with your attacking spells. Ruin 1 is your basic attacking spell, and it functions as your filler spell that you use when nothing more important, like healing, takes priority. Incorporating attacking in group combat is a core part of healing in Final Fantasy XIV, so it is better to practice finding time to do so as early as possible. Of course, it is more important to keep your group alive than being too greedy with damage. Bio 2 is your only damage over time spell, or DOT for short. You should make sure to keep this active on as many enemies as possible before resorting to ruin. For healing, let's start with your own tools first. At Locurium, applies a heal to your target and then applies a shield equivalent to slightly more than the healing done. At Locurium, applies two shields if the heal is a critical heal, making a huge difference between a regular cast and a critical one. At Locurium should be your first choice when you need to heal someone that is expected to take more damage within the next 30 seconds. Additionally, you can use that Locurium on the tank as they start to pull to give them a shield before the fight even starts. Physic is your other healing option, which heals for slightly more than at Locurium and costs less MP to cast, but does not apply a shield. If you have to heal someone and a shield will not help, you should use Physic. If you need to heal someone who already has a shield, using Physic is also more effective, as shields will not stack. This also means that in most situations where you spam heal a target, you should alternate between Atlocurium and Physic to make sure each shield is completely spent before applying another. Note, however, that players not being completely topped up on HP is not a reason to cast heals on them yourself. I will explain this a bit later. Resurrection brings a dead player back to life. It is quite expensive and takes a long time to cast, so outside of desperate situations, you should only cast Resurrection alongside Swift Cast, a roll action that makes your next spell with a cast time instant. This of course means you can only reliably raise someone once per minute. Note that when a player is resurrected, they are completely impervious to damage and effects applied by damage for 5 seconds unless they do anything other than movement. Using Sprint also removes this effect. Finally, Isuna is a role action that removes a single removable debuff. You can identify a removable debuff by the bluish white line above the debuff icon. Some debuffs are more important to remove than others. For instance, a slow effect, whether it is movement or attack speed, is likely to assist your group more than spending that time casting ruin. Paralyze is especially important to remove, as the random stuns from it can be lethal, or especially problematic for mages, including yourself. Sometimes dots can be removed too, and sometimes they can be dangerous, and other times they are so weak that it isn't worth the effort of removing them. You can only tell from the damage the affected player ends up taking, and then keeping it in mind for the future. Lucid Dreaming allows you to greatly boost your MP recovery every minute, and I recommend that you use this whenever you are below 8000 MP. If you are actively casting, then most of the value of Lucid Dreaming will still be applied. Lucid Dreaming should absolutely not be kept as a last resort reserve when you're already out of MP. Use it early and often, even if some of the MP it grants ends up going to waste. Now, let's talk about your pets. Your summons, whether it is Eos, Selene or Kabungle, are all functionally identical, so you're just choosing between which one you like better visually. Your pet will automatically cast Embrace every 3 seconds on whoever needs healing, and typically prioritizes whoever has the least HP percent left. This also means that if no one needs healing, your pet will just do nothing. As such, it is important to not waste your own time topping up everyone. Try to keep cool and let your pet do most of the work for you, and only step in and assist when the healing is overwhelming the amount your pet can manage. An advanced technique that can be immensely useful to start practicing early on is manually moving your pet. Under the Pet tab in the Order section of your Actions and Traits, you will find the options Place and Heal. Place can be used to, for instance, place your pet in the center of the room to maximize your pet's reach. In fact, Embrace has such a massive range that outside of gigantic Alliance Raid arenas, your pet can almost always reach everyone when standing in the center of the arena. You can also adjust your pet's position so that it is somewhere in the middle of your team to maximize its ability to hit your team with other abilities. Once fighting is over, you can then use Heal to make your pet follow you again. Place and Heal are not actions, so you can use these while casting. You also have the ability Whispering Dawn, which orders your pet to use Whispering Dawn. Shocking, really. Which, in an area of effect, or AoE for short, applies a heal over time, not for short, in a large area around your pet. 
This makes it especially important to position your pet somewhere in the middle of your group to optimize it, as while Embrace can reach almost everything while standing in the middle of an arena, Whispering Dawn cannot. Be aware that if your pet is following you, it will stop to cast Whispering Dawn at the exact location you stood when you ordered it. If instead you order it to move somewhere and then order Whispering Dawn, your pet will cast Whispering Dawn from the spot you ordered them to move to, causing a small delay. Embrace, on the other hand, is not delayed by movement actions. When your party needs significant AoE healing, use Whispering Dawn. You can also use Whispering Dawn if your tank is taking a lot of damage to help you further. Finally, Repose is a role action you can use to crowd control enemies, and comically, the damage over time of Bio does not break the effect. However, any other damage will break it, so you will probably not need this spell much. Before moving on to new actions, I want to briefly talk about weaving. In Final Fantasy XIV, spells incur a 2.5 second time frame where you cannot initiate another spell. Abilities do not do this, and furthermore, are not impeded by this 2.5 second time frame either. However, abilities still cause an animation lock that prevents you from casting anything else for around half a second and then some. Weaving is the concept of weaving abilities between spells, notably spells with a cast time of 1.5 or less, you can fit one ability before the next spell. Instant spells allows you to fit two abilities if necessary. As Ruin has a cast time of 1.5, this allows you to easily weave abilities like Lucid Dreaming and Whispering Dawn between two attacks. If you want to learn more about this subject, I have two shots going over the global cooldown and weaving in a bit more depth. Now then, at level 35, you learn the spell Sucker, which is an AoE alternative to Adlocurium. Usually, Sucker is more effective than Adlocurium if at least two players benefit from the value of both the healing and the shield. However, Sucker lacks the shield doubling effect on critical heals that Adlocurium has. If more than two players need healing at all, then Sucker is also more effective than Physic for just the healing. It is worth noting, however, that Physic uniquely is a lot cheaper than the other two options, so if you're about to run completely out of MP, Physic may end up being your most reliable option to stay afloat. At level 38, you learn the spell Ruin 2. Confusingly, Ruin 2 is not an upgrade of Ruin 1. In fact, Ruin 2 does slightly less damage than Ruin 1. The advantage of Ruin 2, however, is that it is instant. The damage difference between Ruin 1 and 2 is so small that if you need the greater mobility and freedom of Ruin 2, it is worth using. In fact, until Ruin 1 upgrades to Broil at level 54, Ruin 2 is actually superior to Ruin 1, if you are auto-attacking. How is that possible, you might ask? Scholar auto-attacks are surprisingly strong for a mage, and at level 50, they are worth around 19 potency per 2.5 seconds. You also attack every 3-ish seconds. This number is actually larger at lower levels. Yes, you can still auto attack while casting Rune 1, but each Rune 1 cast actually delays your next auto attack by one second. In short, you can maximize the damage you do by using Rune 2 instead of Rune 1 and merely attacking enemies between casts. I have a short where I explain this in slightly more detail if you are interested. At level 40, you learn the ability Fey Illumination, which orders your pet to execute, well, a Fey Illumination. This ability causes party members in range to take slightly less magic damage for a bit, while also increasing healing magic potency, meaning they receive more healing from spells. While most of your healing options at the moment are spells, making this insignificant, it is worth pointing out that healing from abilities is not affected by this, meaning, for example, Whispering Dawn. This means that the most important time to make use of this ability is when you're anticipating large magic damage. You should treat the healing boosting component as more of a side bonus. At level 44, you learn the role action and ability Surecast. This ability makes you immune to most knockbacks, and also makes you immune to interruption as a result of damage. What this means is that sometimes when you're hit with a particularly powerful attack, your spellcast is completely cancelled. This cannot happen when Surecast is active. At level 45, you unlock the Aetherflow gauge, and three actions that interact with it. First, Aetherflow, the ability, causes you to recover 20% of your total MP and also gain 3 Aetherflow stacks in your gauge. This should be used on cooldown every minute, meaning you should plan the use of these 3 Aetherflow stacks one minute at a time. To spend Aetherflow, you first have Lustrate, which as an ability heals one target for a large amount, at the cost of one Aetherflow stack. Lustrate should be your primary action to spend Aetherflow with at this level. When doing large pulls in dungeons, consider using Lustrate before resorting to healing spells. 
Of course, you can alternate between spills and lost rate if you can see you will be out of ether flow for a long time otherwise. Take note that at Locurium and Sucker take slightly longer to cast, making them bad options to weave lost rate alongside. Your second ether flow spender is Energy Drain. The only notable effect of Energy Drain is that it does damage, which means if you have ether flow to spare and the ether flow ability is about to be ready to give you three new stacks, you can use Energy Drain between your spell casts to dump any excess you have before you're given three new stacks. Remember, Lost Rage should be your primary way of using Aetherflow, so Energy Drain should only be considered at all if you don't need Lost Rates. A way to meter this out is to spend one Aetherflow every 20 seconds or so, but using Lost Rates when you need them and Energy Drain moments before Aetherflow becomes ready again is the most effective way to use each of them. At level 46, you learn the spell Art of War, which does the same damage as Ruin 1 in an area around you with no cast time. I already explained how Ruin 2 is superior to Ruin 1 with auto attacks, so I hardly need to explain why Art of War is superior to Ruin 1, simply because it has no cast time. Until you learn Broil at level 54, your primary attack spell should always be Art of War, and try to find time to do auto attacks as well. If you are stuck far away from the boss for an extended period of time, then Ruin 1 is best since you also cannot auto attack. Ruin 2 should only be used if you need to move and are out of range to use Art of War. Note that Art of War is also superior to Bio 2 if there are at least 3 targets to hit. At level 48, you learn the role action and ability Rescue. This only works in combat and only if you and your target are both in combat. Otherwise, you will either be incapable of using it or the game will report that you missed. Rescue will, after about a second delay, drag your target to the location you were in when you cast it. Knockback immunities like Surecast also makes players immune to rescue. The delay before the action takes effect means that you may need to react early when you need to use it, for it to be beneficial at all to your target. Remember that rescue drags the target, so if there's something dangerous between you, this may also cause problems. At level 50, you learn the ability Sacred Soil, which spends an Aetherflow stack to place down a large dome that reduces the damage taken by all party members within it by 10%. Take note that it has a 30 second cooldown unlike your other spenders. You should use Sacred Soil when you're anticipating large AoE damage incoming, or if you measure that the damage your party is taking is large enough that the damage reduction is more valuable than a cast of Lost Trade. To more easily play Sacred Soil, go to Character Configuration and under the Target section toggle Limit Ring Movement to Targeting Range and press Action twice to execute. This way, you can always play Sacred Soil immediately within a feasible location by pressing its keybind twice. Now, to round off, let's cover an actual boss fight opener and rotation, followed by some healing advice. Remember, keeping your party alive is always more important than pushing damage, but being efficient with your time also matters. Make sure your pet is summoned and then apply Ad Locurium to the tank before they pull if possible. You can also cast Sucker to give everyone a shield instead. As the tank runs up to the boss, cast Ruin 1, then Bio while weaving Aether Flow and running up to the boss, and then cast Art of War repeatedly. That's basically it. You should make sure to keep Bio active on your targets when there are up to two targets, but with more than two targets, you should simply just use Art of War. For healing, Lost Rage should serve as your primary option, and should be used to assist your pet when its healing isn't sufficient enough. You can often let a tank drop below half HP before bothering to do anything, but it depends on how much you heal per Lost Rage, and on the particular situation, so adjust accordingly. Whispering Dawn should be your default response to raid-wide damage. This means that at Locurium, Sucker, and Physic should all be mainly considered if you run out of Aetherflow or Whispering Dawn isn't enough or isn't available. Sacred Soil and Fey Illumination each also offer options to reduce the damage your party takes, with the first reducing all damage and the second reducing only magic damage. Remember to use Swift Cast together with Resurrection to efficiently raise another player. Isuna can be used to remove dangerous or annoying debuffs when you see the bluish-white line indicating a removable debuff. And of course, use Lucid Dreaming early and often, most effective if used when below 8000 MP. Now, that is all for this video, thank you so much for watching. If you want to support me and my channel, you can like the video, leave a comment, subscribe and hit the bell to get notified when next I post a video. And if you want to give even more support than that, you can also become a member of the channel like these wonderful people here. Fun fact, before Shadowbringers, Scholar had access to Miasma as an additional dot and instead of Art of War, used Miasma 2 as an instant AoE attack that applied a very weak dot. Scholar also had Bane, which for one Aetherflow spread your dots to nearby enemies, putting a lot more emphasis on the offensive Aetherflow options for the job. 
All but one of these dots were removed from the job in Shadowbringers. 